Thanks very much for staying with us. Time now for Eye on Africa with me, Georgia Calvin-Smith. Tonight, tales of dirty tricks, alleged imposters, systems stacked against him. Zimbabwe's main opposition leader walks away from his party just two years after forming it, accusing the ruling party of using underhand tactics to torpedo the CCC. Nelson Chimiza's critics, though, say that he's to blame for the failure. Also, Ghana's first treason case in half a century ends in a death by hanging sentence for six people convicted over a coup plot in 2019. Campaigners call for the end of such sentencing. And we look back at the satisfyingly turbulent group stages of the Africa Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast. The last 16 kicks off this weekend and we consider what's ahead. First of, all, first of all, Nelson Chimiza, Zimbabwe's main opposition leader, has walked away from the Citizens' Coalition for Change party, which he set up in 2022 after he broke away from the MDC, the longtime challenger to the ruling ZANU-PF party. Now, Chimiza, who garnered a respectable 44% in last year's elections, that returned President Manangago with 52.6% of the vote, says that the CCC has been hijacked by the MDC leading to the loss of elected officials. Uh, sorry, hijacked by the ZANU-PF, leading to the loss of elected officials. Nyash Chingono brings us more from Harare. So, Nyash, talk us through some of this complicated subterfuge that, Ch that um, uh, Chimiza is blaming for his quitting the CCC. Good evening, Georgia. Uh, um, the, the, the whole of the Zimbabwean uh, political sphere has been rocked by this announcement by Mr. Chamisa that he is moving away from the CCC after um, uh, forming it about two years ago. Um, he is accusing Zanipia for hijacking uh, his party and contaminating his party. That is through um, uh, state institutions, uh, making sure that they are not heard by the courts. Uh, a few months ago, just after the election, um, and a, a member of the party uh, who was posing himself as the Secretary General uh, just uh, came up saying that he was recalling a dozen MPs from Parliament and he was heard by the courts and the, the, the Speaker of Parliament also managed to effect these recalls. So Shamisa is saying that the incumbent, who is the President Emerson Nangagwa, is behind these machinations uh, to destroy or weaken the opposition party. He's also saying that uh, there, is, uh, there is a ploy to actually create a one-party state in Zimbabwe, through, uh, especially now that the CCC is out of the way. So it's a, it's a developing story, but it's quite interesting to see uh, where uh, Zimbabwean purpose in politics is going to go afterwards. But, I mean, politics is always uh, very complicated in Zimbabwe. Chamisa could never have been expecting a, a smooth ride. His critics say that the flaws that led to the end of his participation in the CCC were, were baked in and that he has no one else to blame but himself. What's that about? OK, so the rise of Nelson Chamisa is always it was surrounded with controversy. After the death of Morgan Sangirai, uh, back in 2018, he was to become the, the, the party president, uh, but not through a, 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 um, a proper procedures because he was the second vice president of the party. So that led to the split, further split of the party. And then in 2000, uh, two years ago, he came up with the CCC uh, where he himself, he made himself the leader, but he did not go through the processes of coming up in the constitution and also taking the, the, the party through uh, a, a Congress. So they say that, um, critics are saying that Chamisa was doomed to fail because he did not have proper structures in place to make sure that he has a smooth running party. He also, Chamisa also has sidelined experienced politicians in the party uh, in favor of newer, you know, uh, fresher minds, uh, younger uh, politicians in the party. So the Chris critics are saying that he was doomed to fail because he uh, sidelined most of his more experienced cadres in, in the party. So this has created... Nash, uh, 
I mean, yeah. so it, it's, it's, it's such a complicated landscape. What does um, all of this mean for the political opposition in Zimbabwe? Because, you know, Chamisa did pretty well, baked in problems or not with the CCC in, in last year's elections. So what happens now? He, he did pretty well. He managed to also garner about 103 uh, seats in parliament, which was really, really good. And he, he posed a great threat to Zanu PF. I think uh, this is a setback for Zimbabwean opposition polit politics, which rose around the year 2000 uh, when Morgan Changrai rose with MDC. Uh, so, so this is a setback. Uh, hopefully, he will be able to reinvigorate himself again and come back again with a more organized uh, uh, form of, op of an opposition party. Uh, but we, uh, but right now, you can tell that uh, there is uh, sort of uh, the opposing politics in Zimbabwe is in disarray uh, because of this announcement. Nyasha, Nyasha Chingona, thank you so much for giving that, giving us that breakdown there from Harare in Zimbabwe. Well, three soldiers are amongst six people sentenced to death in Ghana over their connection to a 2019 coup plot. The men were arrested in 2021 while testing weapons at an old shooting range in Accra. Our Justice Baidu has more. Despite several coup attempts, this is the first time that Ghana is successfully going through a treason trial since the 1960s when its first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, was overthrown. The six who have now been convicted are supposed to die by hanging. They are part of an initial 10 who were arrested in a suburb of Accra, the capital, while testing weapons that they were allegedly going to use in this coup plot. All 10 of them initially pleaded not guilty in a trial that captured the attention of the entire country and went through the country's court systems for two years. They included three uh, soldiers and one senior police officer who, along with two others, were released because the prosecution failed to produce enough evidence to show that they were actively involved in the plot. The prosecution showed in court communication between those who have now been convicted that showed that they were plotting to embark on this activity. Those who have been convicted and their defense say they would appeal the case in the country's highest court, the Supreme Court. Ghana hasn't used the death penalty system since 1992 when the country returned to constitutional rule. This conviction comes at a time when Ghana has had a heightened security environment as the wider West African sub-region has experienced a series of successful coup plots. Justice Baidu, Baidu there for us. Now, 55 people have been killed in clashes between nomadic and settled communities in Nigeria's Plateau State. Despite a 24-hour curfew brought in on Tuesday in the district of Mangu, schools, homes and churches were torched and destroyed just a day later as tensions between the two communities continue to deepen. Camps for the displaced have been set up for about 1,500 people in the region. Intercommunal violence in Plateau has worsened since 200 villagers were killed in raids over the Christmas period. And Britain will return a selection of gold artefacts to Ghana on loan in an historic deal that's not gone down well with many campaigners for the restitution of African heritage looted during colonialism. The 32 objects are regalia taken from an Asante king in the 19th century. Now, they're currently with London's British Museum and Victoria and Albert Museum, but will be loaned to the Mania Palace Museum in Ghana's Kumasi. Now, critics of the deal say that it sends the wrong message and they should just be sent back. The metaphor is, I, you know, someone comes into your home and steals something from your house keeps it in their house, and then, you know, X amount of years later comes and says, I'm going to lend you your thing back. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. But because I've been working, you know, with it, I know the kind of politics that surrounds it and also the kind of attachment to the idea of empire. Well, finally, we're going to take advantage of a momentary lull in what has been a delightfully, for me at least, 
turbulent start to the Africa Cup of Nations in Ivory Coast. There have been some heady ups and some heartbreaking downs, but as the competition readies itself for the last 16, I've got Ellen Toble, our sports editor, coming on set to join me for a bit of a breakdown. Hi, Jojo. Uh, hi, Ellen. Thanks for coming on. So, first of all, what for you are some of the highlights for this first part of what has been literally, I mean... I feel okay about football. It doesn't move me that much, but I have been moved. What were, <laughs> what were the big moments for you? The big moments was, I think, Cabo Verde. I can talk about also this team of Namibia, the, the brave warriors of Namibia. Those team, we didn't expect them to, uh, to, uh, to play this well during mm. this tournament. And they changed everything and they give us that um, unbelievable, uh, like, Sentiment during all the, the, the this first uh, this first part of the of the of the Afcon and it's so tremendous to have a kind of um, this kind of competition for now. Like like we always say, star always come from unexpected places during Afcon. Hmm. And actually, it's like every minor teams during this competition is able to win big, mm -hmm. and that is why this competition is so interesting right now. When you see, like I say, Namibia, we can also talk about even though they get elim eliminated in Tanzania, the way they play, they this change everything. So we really look forward for the next step because those teams we hope can make things much more better for the for, for the next part of the competition. Yeah, it does look like they're no longer any like small teams in Africa. Um so a lot of a lot of surprises, very mm -hmm. exciting surprises. Um but the next uh the last 16 kicks off on Saturday. Exactly. What are you going to be looking out for in this next stage? You know, I'll start with the two games of Saturday because these those games for me sum up all this first part of the competition. Mm. Because we have uh, we started with um, Senegal Ivory Coast that will be on Monday, but on this Saturday we have a, a game between Namibia and uh, Equatorial Guinea. If I if I didn't um, uh, misunderstood on. It's like having small teams, big teams. And you have also in Nigeria against um, Cameroon. Those two, those two countries have eight, um, eight FCON, mm -hmm. five for uh, Cameroon, three for Nigeria. Oh, the first game on Saturday, excuse me, was Angola with um, Namibia. So those games is the first time they are on that stage. So it's changed everything to see those teams. But we have other big games like Morocco against South Africa. They are used to play those games. But Cabe Verde against Mauritania is... Those teams bring new life to this competition. Mm -hmm. I think at the beginning of the competition, people were complaining about the fact that there is too many teams and too many small teams. Mm -hmm. But now those small teams make this tournament a new and great tournament. Yeah. And that's why I... I assure you, you have to watch those I games. Have, I honestly, every of it's them. been so exciting. I'm, you know, I'm professional, but a generally a casual observer. But literally, I've been in the office upstairs being like, go! The, that Ghana game sent me mental. I was like, what happened? Exactly. I looked away for two seconds. I looked back and it was a complete reversal. That's why anyway. we love Ifcon. I'm going to be, I and I hope our viewers will continue to follow the tournament. Elam, thanks so much for coming on and talking us through. That is, though, all the time we have for, for Iron Africa at the moment. Please do join us again, though, when you have a chance. Till then, take care.